Goedemorgen, een nieuwe koffiebreek met vandaag twee studenten. We hadden al een docent, twee docenten, een student. En ja, dan is het logisch om nu ook een keer twee studenten te hebben. Uh, ik uh, kwam op hun pad, of zij kwamen liever beter gezegd, zij kwamen op mijn pad via iemand die zei, ja, maar studenten hebben soms ook hele mooie projecten. Dus ik ben me in hun project gaan verdiepen en uh, ik was eigenlijk best wel onder de indruk van de geweldige website die ze gemaakt hebben daarover. En, maar natuurlijk ook vooral over wat daar allemaal op staat. Um, ladies, could you introduce yourself please? Sure. Hello, yeah. I'm Tessa. And I'm Lana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Philadelphia, USA. And we both study at University College Maastricht. We are both humanities and social science double concentrations. Alana? I'm from Winchester, which is in the south of the UK. And as Tessa said, we're both doing humanities social science concentration, but focusing on very different things when we're studying. But we were both chosen to be a part of this internship for our varied interests. Yeah. And it's important to notice that you are living in the same house. So you're yeah, okay. so you can uh, stay within the one and a half meter or well, Indeed. a little bit closer together because you're already yeah. together very well. And I forgot to tell the audience that we are speaking English, but that's, yeah. I think we are. logical already. So if we can just uh, crop me out going, throwing my head into my hands, that would also be ideal, but that's fine. It's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have fun. Um, so you were doing a project. What was the reason for the project? So the project was an opportunity presented by our faculty, University College Maastricht. It's called Applied Research Internship, and it's designed to help give students a kind of a real life scenario to practice their skills and utilize their problem-based learning. So what happens is a client, in our case, a teacher by the name of Casper, who was teaching the Cambridge A as Global Perspectives course, as well as the Tveitalich BVO program at uh, Portsmouth Santa College, came to University College Maastricht and said, I have a situation, I need some students to help me figure this out. Do you have anyone? And so we applied and um, that is basically the summary of what RE stands for, Applied Research Internship. Right, and our project was a kind of continuation of a working relationship that the school already had with UCM. So it's been, been for the past year now, they've been collaborating with UCM students to answer this problem that they told us about at the school. So we're building on the work of two previous UCM students who they had a very positive time with. And for that reason, Casper reached back out and invited more students into his classroom. So the reason for our specific project is a continuation of what I think all teachers are working towards, but trying to specifically help bridge the gap between the students and the teacher serving as student teachers, but also trying to observe and investigate and research the learning acquisition process, how students perceive the lessons that their teachers are giving, what they pick up, what they perceive the obstacles are and how they summit those obstacles, and to try to determine what are the areas of intervention and create some possible solutions. So that was our mission well, at RE. Nice, it's very clear to me. Uh, what did you do exactly? What 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 did you try? Um, were there things that you, new experiences for you as well? So our official role was obviously to serve as teaching assistants in the classroom. But further than that, it's a pretty basic description. So we kind of came up with a new deficit definition and we termed it accessible authority. So as student teachers, we're kind of people who the students can relate to and feel maybe more comfortable sharing with than their normal teachers. So with, with beyond serving as like our official role as like student teachers, we are also acting as teachers ourselves, which is definitely a new experience because we're very accustomed and sympathetic to the experience of the student, but not so not in the Dutch high school classroom, of course, but we, we can still empathize. And then um, we had never served as teachers. I mean, we had presented in school, of course, but to our peers on a shared project that everyone was learning. So this had, we had to assume a new level of leadership I think it was very motivating for us. Um, and then we had to um, help kind of take this curriculum that's very arbitrary, but I mean, very important, the Cambridge A mm -hmm. Global Perspectives course, and break it down into manageable, digestible portions mm -hmm. that were engaging and interesting to our students. So that was like our main task. And I think that's very much what was on, you know, paper what we would submit 
But at the same time, I think our biggest goal was to make sure that the students were feeling interested in what they were learning, that they were feeling empowered, especially given the current times. And we wanted them to actually benefit from this the experience with us and their education so that they can bring it with them to university and wherever they go in the future. Right. And I think that the client definitely recognizes the unique insight that us as current students can have in his classroom. Because as we're teaching, we're learning as well and kind of experiencing each new corona de development. So we were integrating these changes into how we came up with ideas when we were teaching. Yeah, lovely. Um, but there's, to me, there seems to be like you were students um, and there was Kasper. How did you, what's the difference mainly between what, what, what he normally does and what you were doing? Because he had a question, of course, for you. So, um, I, well, I guess one thing is spatially, we, he was limited because of new Corona regulations. He could only stay in the front part of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So as students, we were able to pull up a seat, sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one to some people. And, you know, formally in our research methods courses, we've learned about, you know, ethnographic interviews or focus groups, but this is a much more casual, deformalized setting. So sometimes you'll be speaking one-on-one -on -one and then their peers are sitting around and they'll, you know, join in or, and having that like back and forth, that's like, not just, okay, what's your research question, but what did you think of the presentation? What made sense to you? What's still in the back of your head? Um, just asking like these kind of, very seemingly, seemingly simple questions, but to try to understand what they're thinking. Because I think there's a lot of responsibility for Casper, the teacher in the classroom, to you know communicate the curriculum to the students. But then it can be hard to also realize that the students also have to absorb everything. And they might not, just because the presentation is finished, understand everything in the presentation, especially when you're in that big you know 20 person classroom, you might not want to raise your hand. So I think we were an accessible um, year for them. And also it's important to note the kind of nature of the course. So it's a pre-university preparatory course. So many of the students there kind of maybe lack a little bit of motivation for the class because they're encouraged to be there for their parents or they, they know they should be there to perform better in university. So I think Casper already noticed that there was sometimes a little bit of a lack of internal passion for what they were doing. So us being students as well, we bridged another gap in the fact that we're an example of these university level attitudes and competencies that they can see and recognize in front of them and want to bring forward into their own work. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, the, the gap, the gap was much clo uh, smaller. Um, right. And how did you, how did you then manage um, for, for, for the students to really like find a topic that they were interested in? Because that's, well, that I find very, very difficult because it, motivation is key. Right. So what did you do? So our main purpose was kind of deconstructing the inaccessibility of academia. We were really keen on them choosing topics and papers that they were actually interested in and you know, wanted to pursue outside of the classroom because it's very easy for them to conceive of a good idea, know they can write a good paper, know that it's appropriate for the class. But when Tessa and I were designing lessons, we really had the priority of them choosing topics they were truly interested in, not just to the function of the end of the class. Mm -hmm. I think a great example of this is um, when the teacher first introduced the fact that they'd be writing a research paper on a global issue. He's like, what are some global issues you all know about? And a few, one or two hands would go up per class, global warming, climate change. Mm -hmm. But could, you could tell there wasn't passion in most of them. And there's kind of this uncertainty and there was recognition of what some global topics were. But I think helping students realize that they know more than they realize they do. Mm -hmm. Mm. they are capable yeah. already and that like um just through consuming social media their day-to-day -day life what they pass in the street they are like witnessing and observing a lot of things that can be blown up to the global perspective and become a global issue so actually sitting down and be like what do you do what are your hobbies what are your interests what do you like in school why do you like that and breaking down these questions so they feel like they are a source of information 
Yeah. I think that really helped. Right. And confident enough to be critical of the things they're consuming and know that they're intelligent and well armed with different thoughts and ideas, not afraid to implement them because they maybe don't go exactly with the curriculum. And Tess and I made a specific lesson plan. Do you mm -hmm. want to discuss the social media exercise we did with them? Do you think it would be relevant? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we made a specific lesson plan where we kind of wanted to get across this idea of look to the world around you when you're generating topics for your papers, not just into very academic sources and books, etc. So we had them do two things. The first we, was we wanted them to be critical about the media they consume, because as a you know, teenager in the 21st century, they're looking at a lot of things online, whether that's going to be Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, constantly passively consuming it. So me and Tessa kind of said, slow down a little bit, have a look at your feeds, what you're getting suggested, advertised, and be more critical about what you're seeing. So we had them do an exercise where they screenshotted different pictures or articles that came up on their feeds and tried to identify global topics within these that they wouldn't normally stop to look at. Uh -huh. And that was a really fruitful lesson plan because when we came back to them the following week and we saw what they had been doing, a lot of the students had actually taken that to mind and analyzed their own social media feeds and come up with super, super insightful topic ideas springboarded from that. I think it was nice because sometimes when you're assigning these readings, it's you're forcing a fit that isn't there. But if you take something that they're already doing and right. enjoying doing and doing mm -hmm. habitually, and draw the connection to your classwork, then everything increases the pertinence of everything. And this, we also, the second part of the exercise mm. was to just walk around your neighborhood, but like slower and not just stare at your feet or your phone, but put your eyes up and look around. Mm -hmm. And we asked, had anyone traveled to a new city before? And that kind of lens where you're just in awe of everything and taking everything in, try to remember what that was like when you're walking to the grocery store going on your daily or hopefully but at least bi-weekly walk because of corona to get your exercise so yeah. you know we can make it useful we're not going to change your life patterns mm -hmm. but make it relevant and we had one group talk after walking around their neighborhood they were like there's a lot of dairy farmers here antibiotic resistance how does this correlate this is a global topic and that's just from looking around their neighborhood and making having that realization that yeah might connect to climate change and you know nationalism but it's much more personal right and in alignment with the kind of ultimate objectives of the gp course we wanted to kind of trick them into putting this critical hat on and hope that they'll bring this skill forward so in the future when they're browsing social media walking around their neighborhood they'll kind of be more set onto this mindset of not just taking something at face value, but kind of picking it apart subconsciously and analyzing it for a little bit more than it is. Uh, do you think this is this this like this model is also use very usable in higher education? Is it the same? Is, can you, can you it's say it's just it's just education? You can apply it everywhere. I think it's especially. I mean, I would hope it's relevant through all parts of education, but I think it's especially relevant when you get to the higher levels of education, Definitely. because when you're graduating high school, you have to apply to a program that'll determine what you're interested in studying. And if a student has never been asked to apply their interests to what they're learning in school, how are they going to really know what they are passionate about? You know, and so much of your first year in university is figuring things out and trying to establish confidence with who you are as a student. And I think a lot of people go into university feeling like I'm not prepared for this. Right. This is so different than high school. But if you're repeatedly practicing these skills and if the teacher is reminding you that you have this confidence and you're con connecting your interests that seem like hobbies that seem like so separate from school, but connecting right. them to what you're learning, mm -hmm. then that's actually, that will add confidence and skill awareness and Definitely. I think it's very applicable for university. And right. there you go. Being like being given confirmation that they're succeeding and this is effective and appropriate ways to do school, to take stuff you're interested in, as Tessa said, that feels so separate, far removed, non-academic, and investigate that and make your own projects and research coming off these things. Yeah. I think it leaves you with a much better and critical mindset with which to start your first year of uni. Yeah. And as we're looking at university and the trends that um, pedagogy seems to take in terms of, you know, liberal arts programs, right. critical thinking and the problem-based learning idea that is very student-driven. 
So you need some intrinsic motivation. And that comes from, like you were saying, um, where, how do you get motivation? It's asking, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Because mm -hmm. I want to be, and I can, mm -hmm. not because I have to do and my parents said so. Yeah, yeah, well, parents. <laughs> <laughs> well, parents can Especially. say things, but <laughs> they're old. <laughs> uh, um, um, yeah, there's one more thing I want to ask. Oh, two things that I want to ask. I want to ask yeah. a personal thing, but before that, um, you've, already, you've also changed the way you were reporting because normally we would write articles on paper but you have put up a very, very beautiful website with a lot of theory and a lot of practice and a lot of, so how did you come, come up with that idea? Well, at first I wanted to make a video. Yeah. And we were like, that's a bit much. Um, so <laughs> of course, sometimes you, you shoot for all the way up here and you have to make it actually manageable, which we're teaching our students to do. Yeah. But setting feasible goals, et cetera, et cetera. But we basically wanted to make sure that we made a resource that didn't just die in the Dropbox of the assignment where we need to submit it. So we wanted to kind of make something which was widely accessible, but also buildable for other educators. So like you said, it can also apply in the context of higher education and university. So it's really important that we kind of made something which was a foundation rather than just a finished report. Yes. In addition, we did not want to be hypocritical. We were here to be, to try to make learning more engaging and interesting. Yeah. So if we were just to write another 25 page report, that, that wouldn't have reflected all the things we had done. And so we added visuals. We tried to represent different ideas and break up the text and bold things and, right. you know, reflect in, as much as we could in a website, you know, free format design, what we had learned in the past five months yeah. from teaching. I think it was also important that the tools and skills we were gathering were so dynamic that it didn't make sense to put it into a report and just put it, you know, in bullet mm -hmm. points. So being able to click through the website, read about our experiences and then new tab kind of research methodology, I think makes a lot more sense because it wasn't so much of a linear, linear project. It was way more connectionist in the fact that we started with one idea, came up with four, you know, things were going all over the place, all over the time, kind of like a big <laughs> web rather than, you know, a simple linear progress. Maybe, yes. maybe, maybe you put up a new standard, in my opinion, because it looks very nice and it's very, yeah, well, it's, it's just, it's also entertaining. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's perfect. So I got one more question because um, from being from UK and from the US, do you have, do you ever have uh, conflicts on words or can you really understand what you're saying, the two of you, or do you have, uh, well? Um, I think the main point of contention is the spelling. So we have very different ways to, uh. to use the letter Z, otherwise known as, you know, Z. not at all. It's not Z, Z. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> but I think um, in terms of our, we had to be very aware that our English was different and that could be overwhelming for our students, especially because they are not native English speakers. So we had to learn to slow down our pace, um, be careful with our word choice. But I think when it comes to confusion, it usually mm -hmm. happens as roommates, less th so than as team teammates or researchers, right. because the academic English has more overlap than the trackies versus sweatpants, um, hob top versus stove top, that sort of debate. But we did have to make a Google doc to keep it all organized right. because we are nerds at heart. Yes, wow. like Tessa said, in the classroom, everything was very deliberate and premeditated. And we decided we're gonna use this term for this exercise you and I know what this means. We're going to communicate an exact definition. But when you get into the kitchen in our house, absolute madness. You never know what we're trying to talk about. We normally just kind of grunt and gesture. Brilliant. Yeah, well, I love talking to you. And, and you're really an inspiration to, to me. Uh, seen, well, beautiful website. I got a very good idea about your project. And I think, I think you bridged the gap in a very, very nice way. Uh, studying this and uh, yeah um, I'm very impressed so I hope to see you once uh, maybe in the future then when we are when corona is gone and I will travel to all the way to Maastricht 
Uh, <laughs> you, you say that's very close by Tessa Hebe. For me, of course, for Amsterdam, it's very far, but I, I, I will try and I hope to see you sometime in the future and, uh, and, and well, have a good other years of study, huh? Because uh, you need to go a few more years, I guess. So, um, and for um, allowing this to reach a wider audience. We're and very grateful that you've given us a platform for this because yes. we were so happy to be involved and it's really nice to kind of share the message as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I will write a nice article and uh, you will hear from me. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye, goodbye.